Kowalski's wild horse has narrowly escaped extinction. By 1969, the species had vanished in the wild, but 12 survivors remained in different zoos. They were bred to reintroduce the species in Mongolia. Today, wild horses are again grazing on the Mongolian steppes. They're also to be found on the Plateau des Cévennes and the Mont d'Azur in France. Recently, though, a serious anomaly was detected in the skulls of these Prowalski wild horses. The mysterious syndrome could again endanger the recently revived species. Small and stocky, with a white belly, long ears, high eyes and a flat forehead, and a short, erect mane, the shy, temperamental Prowalski was snatched back from the brink in the nick of time. It's the only horse that has never been tamed by humans and still lives in the wild. In the equine world, it shares this distinction with zebras. Some Prowalskis have stripes on their legs too, along with the last African wild asses and their Asian cousin, the Onager. The Prowalski's beige coat with darker extremities blends in perfectly with the landscapes of the steppes. At the Institute of Sciences and Evolution in Montpellier, a young paleontologist, Laure Danilo, studies equine evolution, especially comparing modern horses with fossils 35 to 55 million years old. She's particularly interested in the internal structures of the skull, the encephalon, and the inner ear. Examining Prowalski's skulls from every angle, Laure Danilo detected a completely unexpected morphological anomaly, a malformation of the bones in the face of the skull. She discovered that 92% of Prowalski's wild horses that have died in the last 20 years have displayed the striking abnormality, facial asymmetry. Here is the skull of the Prowalski horse. When you put a ruler here along this line, you see that in this skull, there's a displacement of the bones here to the right. And above all, you can see diagonal instead of level tooth wear. In other words, irregular wear of the teeth caused by this facial asymmetry. This means the upper and lower teeth are no longer flush. The seemingly minor asymmetry is actually very serious and can even be fatal. It causes abnormal wear of the teeth aggravated when the horses graze. And since they graze for 14 hours a day, the asymmetry halves their life expectancy. This is terrible news for a species that narrowly escaped extinction not long ago and is still very vulnerable. So what is the cause of this strange disorder? In 1879, Colonel Nikolai Mikhailovich Prowalski, a Russian explorer, was in the mountains that border the Gobi Desert in Zungaria. There, he discovered a formerly unknown wild horse that was named for him, Prowalski. This animal was an immediate sensation. Many collectors in private zoos and parks were eager to acquire this curiosity. Each wanted their own specimen. In 1901 alone, 52 colts were captured. Their wild, stubborn parents were simply shot. Only 28 of those colts reached Europe alive. 
The last Provosky's wild horse was seen in the Gobi Desert in 1969. It had taken just half a century of thoughtlessness to destroy the species in the wild. Then, salvation came from the Netherlands. A Dutch couple, Jan and Inge Buman, were shocked to see a Prowalski wasting away in the concrete setting of Prague Zoo and decided to fight to restore the species' freedom. A breeding program was organized among animals from Europe's main zoos. Fifteen years later, the first Prowalski returned to Mongolia. This was in 1992. Eighty-four more horses would join them over the next ten years. They were successfully reintroduced in Hustai National Park, where there are 250 today. So it was that the Prowalski wild horse at last returned to the land where it had once found refuge from the humans that hunted it in Europe and the rest of the world, Mongolia. This amazing story explains the malformation that threatens the species today. Prowalski's wild horse are all cousins, descended from a surviving population of just a dozen, and are now severely inbred. This is the cause of the facial asymmetry. So, can the Prowalski wild horse be saved from extinction a second time? The proposed solution is to divide the horses into groups living apart. Over generations, they should evolve separately and mutation will again differentiate their genes. The theory is being applied on a vast reserve in San Cibrián de Muda, Spain. In Le Cos, France, Sébastien Carton de Gramont is part of the project. He runs the TAC Association, founded by Claudia Fay to conserve the Prowalski wild horse. The society has already successfully organized two shipments of horses to Mongolia. On the steps of Le Cosmejan in the Cévennes, 39 Prowalski wild horses now populate the reserve's 400 hectares. Since each horse needs 10 hectares to graze on, the reserve is full, and it's in everyone's interest to send a number of its horses to Spain. Le Villaret is home to three family groups, each made up of ten or so horses. They include a dominant stallion, three or four mares, and their young. Prowalski families live side by side but do not mix. Offenders are frequently reminded of this rule. Eleven lone stallions remain at a distance competing for the only unattached mare currently available. They gaze enviously at the three families who'd rather be left alone. To defuse the potentially dangerous situation, Sebastian is planning to send three or four of the stallions to start a new life in Spain. If they adapt to the territory successfully, a complete family could follow in their hoof steps. Male and female colts are banished from the group when they become adults at the age of about three or four. They have to find a mate elsewhere to raise their own family. This limits any risk of incest. The Prowalski bloodlines have to be regenerated to reduce the level of inbreeding. And the clock is ticking. The plan is to move the horses to separate territories to improve their gene pool. Sébastien understands the need for this, but he's sad to see his horses go. He's raised each one from birth and knows how risky such an operation can be for them. The Prowalskis are extremely wild and far harder to transport than domestic animals. The time has come to capture the stallions. 
An enclosure with greener, thicker grass is left open to attract them. A little water and salt are added bait. The next day, Sebastian simply has to close the trap. A small group of single males of four stallions, and that's it. A kind of preliminary stage before we probably send an entire family later on. This is always a rather tricky operation. The horses tend to get quite stressed when they're penned in. Angoulevent is the oldest of the stallions and also the most headstrong. He isn't about to go quietly. He takes his frustration out on Avon, a younger, quieter stallion. horses are still on edge. Sebastien has to do something before they exhaust or hurt themselves. Angoulevent could injure Avon. Since the younger horse needs protection, Sebastien decides he won't be going on the journey. The candidates must get along if they're to cope properly with the trials and unfamiliar surroundings that await them. So 13-year-old Angoulevent will only be accompanied by Sarine and Apollo two four-year-old stallions. They are calmer by the time Sebastian herds them into the departure pen. There's no animosity between them, and that's vital to the operation's success. In a few days, Angoulevent, Serene, and Apollo will leave Le Cos Maison and cross the Pyrenees. Ulan Batar and Mongolia as a whole will also play a decisive role in the future of the Prowalski wild horse. The home of Genghis Khan has always been a land of horses and ponies. Less than 100 kilometers from the capital, the Hustai National Park provides the Prowalskis with vast expanses of steppe, occasionally relieved by a few rows of birch. Namkai Bandi is now the director of the reserve he's known since it was founded. Today, he's received pictures of the Tak Association's Prowalskis from France. These are wild horses in France. The campaign to counter inbreeding requires close cooperation between the different conservation centers. Namkai Bandi himself has helped to diversify the Prowalski gene pool by sending 70 of his horses to Takintal, another region of Mongolia adjoining the Gobi Desert. A very harsh winter has weakened the herd sent there, but in years to come, Mongolian horses may join their fellows in Spain and vice versa. <laughs> It is the eve of the great day at Le Cos Mijan. Sebastien pampers the horses heading for Spain, preparing them for the trial they're about to face. Usually, he interacts with them as little as possible. The horses have to cope on their own. The only resource he provides is a little water, since there are no rivers or streams in Le Cos. But the horses about to leave for Spain are a special case. They need a little fodder to boost their energy in this very cold weather. If at least two of them get on well together, things will go more smoothly in Spain. Sebastian is anxious. It looks like it's going to be a long night. On the morning of the departure, an entire team has come to lend Sebastian a hand. The Prowalskis are wild animals and their journey could end in disaster if they rear and buck. Representatives from the Spanish Reserve have arrived to collect the new residents. It's a long trip by road and the horses will have to be patient, so it is vital to avoid the kind of stress that could prejudice the operation. <laughs> Unlike domestic horses, the Prowalskis need to be anesthetized before they're loaded into the truck. 
The anesthetic takes a while to work. Sebastian watches closely. Angoulevent is a powerful beast. He fights against the anesthetic. Sebastian is worried about his protege. Angoulevent struggles hard to stay awake. He needs a larger dose. It's the only way to put him under. C'est bon, avance, avance. Allez, tire. Allez, un, deux, trois. At last, Angoulevent, Serene, and Apollo are ready to head off on the road to Spain. A lot of hopes are riding with them. If they adapt to their new environment, an entire family can follow, establishing a further colony of Provalski's wild horse in Spain. This is a new hope and a vital chapter in the strategy to combat inbreeding. Ultimately, another territory, another biotope, and another climate will all contribute to genetic differentiation. Sebastian watches as his charges take their first steps on Spanish soil. There's a temporary pen waiting for them, where they can adapt to their new surroundings, but only for a while. The project actually covers a huge expanse of no less than 700,000 hectares, enough for thousands of Provalski's wild horses. Meanwhile, we'll have to wait to find out how the horses from Le Cosme Maison will react. Can Angoulevent, Serene and Apollo successfully adapt to this new territory? Kowalski's wild horses returned to Mongolia. They acclimatized without too much difficulty. But having lost all sense of social structure in captivity, the zoo animals released into the wild failed to recover their natural instincts. Even the next generation has struggled to cooperate.
As night falls, different groups meet and clash on their way to find water. Rival stallions waste their energy on skirmishes, fights, and conflicts, preventing them from carrying out their essential duties, breeding and maintaining order in their families. Kowalski's social structures suffer from this disorder. Some families quarrel endlessly, and the background conflict occasionally claims a young animal's life, even if the killing is generally accidental rather than deliberate. The loss of a colt is always a disaster. one of the victims of this anarchy. The stallion got into a fight when he tried to muscle in on a mare that didn't belong to him. During the messy brawl, his opponent landed a bone-shattering kick. The broken leg healed badly. Newell's resulting limp has left him with no hope of starting a family. He cannot attract a harem, and that too is a great loss for his species. Every stallion that fails to breed means fewer colts in future. For four years, the lame Noor has doggedly wandered the vast steppes, apparently condemned to lifelong solitude. Uve was injured in a similar incident. His dented skull reflects the violence of the blow. Yet, he hasn't lost hope. In San Cebrián de Muda in Spain, Sebastián is preparing to say goodbye to his Prevalski stallions. They appear to be getting along well in this new environment and don't seem stressed. Their close contact is an encouraging sign. I think they will be okay here. Yes. It's a good grassland mm -hmm. for them. I think uh, it's a good place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the reserved Spanish director, Fernando Moran, will take care of Angulvan, Serene, and Apollo. Sebastian? is heading back to the Cévennes. The Cévennes, where an incident has just been reported. Sandrine Descaves, head of the course unit of the Cévennes Park, has learned that a domestic foal has been attacked and killed. The autopsy results are clear. A wolf is at loose in the Cévennes. The attacker was caught on National Park surveillance cameras and its picture is immediately circulated. With its low tail, rounded ears, and white jowls, it is clearly a wolf of Italian stock. At La Fichade, the farmer who lost the foal takes his precautions. He can shut in his sheep, hens, and horses at night, but during the day, 
a way must be found to stop the predators attacking his vulnerable thoroughbreds and possibly their Prowalski wild horses. The authorities are firm. Although the farmers are part of the Savennes' local heritage and must be protected, they have to tolerate wolves. To help wolves and stock breeders coexist peacefully, the National Park has come up with a new system that Sandrine Descaves installed near the thoroughbred's enclosure. It's a radio that regularly plays sounds to simulate a human presence. It should keep the wolf away from its potential prey. Kowalski wild horses grazing on the coast must rely solely on their own defensive strategies. They need to recover their ancestral instincts and natural social organization. But how is that possible after all those years spent in zoos? A man named Patrice Langour may have an answer. Not far from Nice in the Mont d'Azur, an idea is taking shape in his mind. A species in a zoo is just a shell. You conserve the shell, but you don't conserve the species. In a zoo, you lose, so to speak, half of a species because you lose all of its social behavior, and that's an integral part of the species. Patrice Longour's idea is that the Prowalski's wild horses may relearn cooperative behavior and recover their social instincts in contact with a rival species that lived alongside their ancestors. But what kind of ecosystem were these ancestors part of? In our collective imagination, the Prowalski's wild horse resembles the equines that inspired Paleolithic Homo sapiens when they produced their cave paintings. <laughs> Certain ancestral physical traits suggest that the Prowalski's precursor did coexist with the deer and bison painted on the vaults of the Lascaux Caves. seems to be the same color and have the same type of erect mane as well as a darker stripe along its spine. It has a similar short nose. The truth may be lurking in the shadows of prehistory. The variety needed to enrich the species is now to be found on Patrice Longour's land in the Mont d'Azur. Stags, bison and boars will graze and root alongside the Prowalskis and it is hoped have a positive effect. Some people are worried there'll be fights and injuries. But conflict is actually the underlying principle of Patrice Longour's theory. <coughs> to understand how the different species will interact, He's counting on the work of Olivier Dufour and Hervé Glotta, two bioacousticians from the University of Toulon. Probing the ocean depths, the pair picked up echoes revealing how dolphins and whales coexist. The same methods can be applied to Prowalski's wild horses. We 
pourrait faire des mesures. Nous pouvons prendre des mesurements acoustiques de l'une espèce à l'autre. Oui, définitivement. Et voir si elles si compétent dans un domaine purement acoustique. Oui, c'est vraiment intéressé, M. Longor. C'est un travail de pionnier. L'acoustique recherche n'a jamais été faite sur les mammifères de l'eau. L'aim est de continuer à recorder tous les sons faits par les différentes mots d'azur species pour une semaine. Les scientifiques vont ensuite utiliser le recording pour analyser l'interaction de horses, bison et deer. La réserve est à peu près ce bloc. Moi, je pense que... Mon idée est que nous allons aller à peu près dans la zone de 1,400 mètres. Ok. C'est la seule que vous pouvez voir là-bas. Le défi technique ici, c'est de les mettre au sol. We can't put them on the ground because with boars and rutting stags, it's very likely we'll find them completely smashed, especially with such curious animals. The animal sounds will be recorded using a system put together by the bioacousticians. A microphone is connected to a memory card and powered by a battery. Olivier and Patrice explore the reserve to choose the right spot for their recordings, a place where the different species pass by. They pick a location on the border between the forest and plain. In the fork, right? There, a wedge in the box. And then, uh, so who's coming up there? Me. Great, go for it. Hey, we're not primates for nothing. <laughs> the oak tree seems to be an excellent place for a listening post. Before he climbs, Olivier carries out some final tests with Patrice. They also have to adjust the microphone's gain to optimize sound quality. Yes, something deeper. Great. Again? Again? A little whistle now, please. Softer? Yes, that's fine. Something deeper, please. Right, there, do you think that's the same sort of volume as a stag belling? Oh no, not at all, it's much softer. Belling's louder than that. It's louder. Go on again, please. Again? Again? Patrice Longour is quite happy to play along because he knows what's at stake in this experiment. He realizes it will be the best chance to study interaction between the species because there'll be no human presence to influence their behavior. The results should tell him whether his intuition is right or not. Recording will continue uninterrupted for a week over a range of 100 meters using a 360 degree microphone. of Toulon, software is used to analyze the recording. Specific sound signals are detected and identified. There you can hear a number of stags sizing each other up. Olivier Dufour and Hervé Glotin now have all the data they need. By analyzing the sounds, they can detect fear and aggression, 
identify flight and capitulation, and properly interpret appeals for help and warning cries. With the assistance of ecologists, they can use this language to assess species interaction. Results show that the horses do cooperate with each other more closely in the presence of rival species. In Mongolia, deer graze alongside Prawalski's wild horses as they do in France. This coexistence is helping to rewild the horses. Beyond the land of the Hustai National Park, lie vast plains with an uninterrupted view as far as the Altai Mountains. Nomads live here with their huge herds, a common sight in Mongolia. Horses are a great tradition for Undur Biyamba and his family. First of all, they're the perfect means of transport on these endless steps. The hardy, tenacious, tireless Mongol horse can cover tremendous distances at a steady rate of 60 kilometers a day. Genghis Khan carved out one of the greatest empires the world has ever known on the backs of these mounts. Mongol horse also supplies meat and milk. The milk is fermented to make erag, the Mongols' traditional alcoholic drink. The horse's leather is used to cover yurts. Finally, its dried dung acts as fuel in this country, where forests are rare and the winters long and cruel. For all these reasons, the Mongol horse is celebrated once a year at a famous national meeting where riders and their mounts compete in great races and show off their skills. Mongolia also has the highest number of horses per capita of any country in the world. It is unquestionably the land of the horse. Yet the nomad's proximity to the Hustai National Park poses a new threat to the Prawalski wild horse there. Domestic horses live in semi-freedom in the region, a halgan, for instance. On three occasions, Undur Biyamba came to Hustai to search for his runaway horse among the wild Prawalskis. Despite the distance, Halgan set off to find his Prawalski friends three times. Each time, he joined the same family group. The dominant stallion accepted the newcomer and even befriended him. Now, Ahalgan lives happily with his chosen adoptive family. Fortunately, he's no danger to the Prawalskis. He's a gelding. The National Park Director's greatest fear is that domestic horses will wander onto the reserve and mate with the wild horses. That's how Undur Biyamba lost his domestic horse. So, domestic horses aren't welcome here. In just a few generations, their genes could dilute the Prawalski gene pool.
domestic horses and Prabalskis are interfertile and can give birth to fertile foals. If that happened, the Prabalski's wild horse could lose its specific identity. In the past, nomads favored interbreeding to improve their domestic horses with new blood from another stock. Today, guards protect the specific gene pool of the Prowalski wild horse, intervening immediately whenever an intruder is reported. Each trespasser is summarily arrested and deported from the park. Since there are no fences, that's the only option. One morning, in early winter, Namkai Bandi and his driver set out on their tour of inspection in their Soviet-made off-road vehicle, a Waz. Winter is just beginning and will last from September to June with the thermometer plunging to minus 40 degrees Celsius. But Prowalski's wild horses are hardy and can withstand these extreme conditions. When snow falls, they instinctively dig down to the grass below. Today, unexpectedly, unusually, they're lying on the ground. What's strange about that? Well, if they're worried or sense danger, the horses sleep standing up, ready to defend themselves prepare to react at once. Their recumbent position is a sign that they feel very secure. So what led to this sudden confidence so clearly reflected in their posture? Namkai Bandi knows the horses well and is intrigued by their behavior. He decides to stay and watch the group. He is in for a surprise. A lone stallion eyes the group with interest. The family's dominant male, Karanga, sets off to repel the intruder. Karanga heads towards the trespasser at a firm pace. Confrontation seems inevitable. But the dominant male puts on just enough of a show to get his message across. Finally, he deposits a symbolic pile of dung to mark his territory, 
watched discreetly and submissively by the intruder. Head held high, assertive posture, proud swagger, all the signs of a job well done. Now Karanga can return to his group, confident and pleased with himself. A stallion's mission accomplished. All that remains is to round up the others. There's no challenge to his authority. He has protected his family in exemplary fashion. This is a fantastic news for the parks director. A Hustai stallion at the height of his powers is leading his family with a light but firm touch. The long-awaited moment has come. Today, Namkai Bandi can continue his inspection tour with a weight off his mind. If one horse's natural skills have resurfaced so completely, it can happen to others and certainly will. Fortune is smiling on the Prowalski's wild horse at last. Noor, the horse who seemed destined for a solitary existence, has found a friend in need. The companionship is bound to lighten his load. There's also good news for Uve. Despite his battered face and sinister appearance, he's managed to find a mate. He keeps a close eye on her to make sure she doesn't slip away. When she gazes at a family she'd clearly like to join, he puts on a formal show of jealousy and also marks the ground with his dung to show he's the master. Then, with his head lowered, he follows the mare, ready to repeat the lesson. He's gone to a lot of trouble to find himself a mate and has absolutely no intention of letting her get away. Many people have fought to protect the Prowalski wild horse from the direct or indirect ravages of inbreeding, and many more are carrying on the work in Mongolia, the Netherlands, France, and Spain today. Hopes are growing. The thunderclouds looming over the miraculously saved horses are beginning to clear. Soon, the Prowalski wild horse may be back for good.